The Secret of Dunstan's Tower IT was a peculiarity of Mr. Corrado's that he could drop the most absorbing occupation of his daily life at a moment's notice if need be, apply himself exclusively to the solution of some criminological problem, possibly a matter of several days, and at the end of the time return and take up the thread of his private business exactly where he had left it. On the morning of the 3rd of September he was dictating to his secretary a monograph to which he had given the attractive title, The Portrait of Alexander the Great, as Jupiter Ammon, on an unedited octodram of Macedonia, when a telegram was brought in. Greatorex, the secretary, dealt with such communications as a matter of course, and, taking the envelope from Parkinson's salver, he cut it open in the pause between a couple of sentences. This is a private matter of yours, sir, he remarked, after glancing at the message. Handed in at Nether Hemsfield, 10.48 a.m. repeated. One step higher. Quite baffled. Talak. Oh yes, that's all right, said Corrados. No reply, Parkinson. Have you got down the Roman supremacy? The type of workmanship that still enshrined the memory of Spartan influence down to the era of Roman supremacy, read the secretary. That will do. How are the trains for Nether Hemsfield? Greater Rex put down the notebook and took up an ABC. Waterloo departure 11, he cocked an eye towards the desk clock. Oh, that's no good. 12.17, 2.11, 5.9, 7 5.9, 7.25. The 5.9 should do, interposed Corrado's. Arrival? 6.48 Now what has the gazetteer to say about the place? The yellow railway guide gave place to a weightier volume, and the secretary read out the following details, Nether Hemsfield, Parish and Village, Pop. 7.32, South Downshire 27.28 acres land and 27 water, Soil rich loam, occupied as arable, pasture, orchard and woodland, subsoil various. The Church of St. Dunstan, restored 1740, is Saxon and early English. It possesses an oak roof with curious grotesque bosses, and contains brasses and other memorials, earliest 13th century, of the Innesford family. In the swine field, one and a half miles southwest of the village, are 15 large stones, known locally as the judge and jury, which constitute the remains of a druidical circle and temple. Dunstan's Tower, a moated residence built in the baronial style, and probably dating from the 14th century, is the seat of the Innisfords. I can give three days easily, mused Corrado's. Yes, I'll go down by the 5.9. Do I accompany you, sir? Inquired Greater X. Not this time, I think. Have three days off yourself. Just pick up the correspondence and take things easy. Send out anything to me, care of Dr. Tullock. If I don't write, expect me back on Friday. Very well, Mr. Corrados. What books shall I put out for Parkinson to pack? Say. Gessner's Thesaurus and yes, you may as well add Hilarionist Celtic mythology. Six hours later Corrados was on his way to Nether Hemsfield. In his pocket was the following letter, 
which may be taken as offering the only explanation why he should suddenly decide to visit a place of which he had never even heard until that morning. Dear Mr. Corrados, old win, it used to be, do you remember a fellow at St. Michael's who used to own insects and the name of Tullock Earwigs, they called him? Well, you will find it at the end of this epistle, if you have the patience to get there. I ran across Jarvis about six months ago on Houston platform, you'll recall him by his red hair and great feet, and we had a rapid and comprehensive powwow. He told me who you were, having heard of you from Lessing, who seems to be editing a high-class review. He always was a trifle eccentric, Lessing. As for yours T, well, at the moment I'm local demon in a GFS little place that you'd hardly find on anything less than a 4-inch ordinance. But I won't altogether say it mightn't be worse, for there's trout in the stream, and after half a decade of cinder moor, in the black country, a great and holy peace broods on the smiling land. But you will guess that I wouldn't be taking up the time of a busy man of importance unless I had something to say, and you'd be right. It may interest you, or it may not, but here it is. Living about two miles out of the village, at a sort of medieval stronghold known as Dunstan's Tower, there is an ancient county fa family called Anisford. And, for the matter of that, they are about all there is here, for the whole place seems to belong to them, and their authority runs from the power to charge you two pence if you sell a pig between Friday night and Monday morning to the right to demand an exchange of scabbards with the reigning sovereign whenever he comes within seven bowshot flights of the highest battlement of Dunstan's Tower. I don't gather that any reigning sovereign ever has come. But that isn't the Anisfords' fault. But, levity apart, these Anisfords, without being particularly rich, or having any title, are accorded an extraordinary position. I am told that scarcely a living duchess could hold out against the moral influence old Dame Anisford could bring to bear on social matters, and yet she scarcely ever goes beyond Nether Hemsfield now. My connection with these high and mighties ought to be purely professional, and so, in a manner, it is, but on the top of it I find myself drawn into a full-blooded, old haunted house mystery that takes me clean out of my depth. Darish, the man whose place I'm taking for three months, had a sort of arrangement that once a week he should go up to the tower and amuse old Mrs. Anisford for a couple of hours under the pretense of feeling her pulse. I found that I was let in for continuing this. Fortunately the old dame was quite amiable at close quarters. I have no social qualifications whatever, and we got on very well together on those terms. I have heard that she considers me thoroughly responsible. For five or six weeks everything went on swimmingly. I had just enough to do to keep me from doing nothing. People have a delightful habit of not being taken ill in the night, and there is a comfortable cob to trot round on. Tuesday is my Dunstan's Tower Day. Last Tuesday, I went as usual. I recall now that the servants about the place seemed rather wild and the old lady did not keep me quite as long as usual but these things were not sufficiently noticeable to make any impression on me at the time. Time. On Friday a groom rode over with a note from Swarbrick, the butler. Would I go up that afternoon and see Mrs. Anisford? He had taken the liberty of asking me on his own responsibility as he thought that she ought to be seen. Deuced queer it struck me. But of course I went. Swarbrick was evidently on the lookout. He is a regular family retainer, taciturn and morose rather than bland. 
I saw at once that the old fellow had something on his mind, and I told him that I should like a word with him. We went into the morning room. Now, Swarbrick, I said, you sent for me. What is the matter with your mistress since Tuesday? He looked at me darly, as though he was still in two minds about opening his mouth. Then he said slowly, It isn't since Tuesday, sir. It was on that morning. What was? I asked. The beginning of it, Dr. Tullock. Mrs. Anisford slipped at the foot of the stairs on coming down to breakfast. She did? I said. Well, it couldn't have been very serious at the time. She never mentioned it to me. No, sir, the old monument assented, with an appalling surface of sublime pride, she would not. Why wouldn't she if she was hurt? I demanded. People do mention these things to their medical men in strict confidence. The circumstances are unusual, sir, he replied, without a ruffle of his imperturbable respect. Mrs. Anisford was not hurt, sir. She did not actually fall, but she slipped on a pool of blood. That's unpleasant, I admitted, looking at him sharply, for an owl could have seen that there was something behind all this. How did it come there? Whose was it? Sir Philip Belmont's, sir. I did not know the name. Is he a visitor here? I asked. Not at present, sir. He stayed with us in 1662. He died here, sir, under rather unpleasant circumstances. There you have it, when? That is the keystone of the whole business. But if I keep to my conversation with the still reluctant Swarbrick, I shall run out of fool's cap and into midnight. Briefly, then, the unpleasant circumstances were as follows. Just about two and a half centuries ago, when Charles II was back and things in England were rather gay, a certain Sir Philip Belmont was a guest at Dunstan's Tower. There were dice, and there was a lady, probably a dozen, but the particular one was the Anisford's young wife. One night there was a flare-up. Belmont was run through with a rapier, and an ugly doubt turned on whether the point came out under the shoulder blade or went in there. Dripping onto every stair, the unfortunate man was carried up to his room. He died within a few hours, convinced, from the circumstances, of treachery all round, and with his last breath he left an anathema on every male and female Anisford as the day of their death approached. There are fourteen steps in the flight that Belmont was carried up, and when the pool appears in the wholesome Anisford has just two weeks to live. Each succeeding morning disdain may be found one stair higher. When it reaches the top there is a death in the family. This was the gist of the story. As far as you and I are concerned, it is, of course, merely a matter as to what form our skepticism takes, but my attitude is complicated by the fact that my nominal patient has become a real one. She is 72 and built to be a nonagenarian, but she has gone to bed with the intention of dying on Tuesday week. And I firmly believe she will. How does she know that she is the one? I asked. There aren't many Anisfords, but I knew that there were some others. 
To this Swarbrick maintained a discreet ambiguity. It was not for him to say, he replied, but I can see that he, like most of the natives round here, is obsessed with anus fordism. And for that matter, I objected, your mistress is scarcely entitled to the distinction. She will not really be an anus fort at all, only one by marriage. No, sir, he replied readily, Mrs. Anisford was also a Miss Anisford, served one of the Dorset Anisfords. Mr. Anisford married his cousin. Oh, I said, do the Anisfords often marry cousins? Very frequently, sir. You see, it is difficult otherwise for them to find eligible partners. Well, I saw the lady, explaining that I had not been altogether satisfied with her condition on the Tuesday. It passed, but I was not able to allude to the real business. Swarbrick, in his respectful, cast-iron way, had impressed on me that Sir Philip Belmont must not be mentioned, assuring me that even Darish would not venture to do so. Mrs. Anisford was certainly a little feverish, but there was nothing the matter with her. I left, arranging to call again on the Sunday. When I came to think it over, the first form it took was, now who is playing a silly practical joke, or working a deliberate piece of mischief? But I could not get any further on those lines, because I do not know enough of the circumstances. Darish might know, but Darish is cruising off Spitsbergen, suffering from a nervous breakdown. The people here are amiable enough superficially, but they plainly regard me as an outsider. It was then that I thought of you. From what Jarvis had told me I gathered that you were keen on a mystery for its own sake. Furthermore, though I understand that you are now something of a dook, you might not be averse to a quiet week in the country, jogging along the lanes, smoking a peaceful pipe of an evening and yarning over old times. But I was not going to lure you down and then have the thing turn out to be a ridiculous and transparent hoax no matter how serious its consequences. I owed it to you to make some reasonable investigation myself. This I have now done. On Sunday when I went there Swarbrick, with a very long face, reported that on each morning he had found the stain one step higher. The patient, needless to say, was appreciably worse. When I came down I had made up my mind. Look here, Swarbrick, I said, there is only one thing for it. I must sit up here tonight and see what happens. He was very dubious at first, but I believe the fellow is genuine in his attachment to the house. His final scruple melted when he learned that I should not require him to sit up with me. I enjoined absolute secrecy, and this, in a large rambling place like the tower, is not difficult to maintain. All the maidservants had fled. The only people sleeping within the walls now, beyond those I have mentioned, are two of Mrs. Anisford's grandchildren, a girl and a young man whom I merely know by sight, a housekeeper and a footman. All these had retired long before the butler admitted me by an obscure little door, about half an hour after midnight. The staircase with which we are concerned goes up from the dining hall. A much finer, more modern way ascends from the entrance hall. This earlier one, however, only gives access now to three rooms, a lovely oak panel chamber occupied by my patient in two small rooms, turned nowadays into a boudoir and a bathroom. 
When Swarbrick had left me in an easy chair, wrapped in a couple of rugs, in a corner of the dark dining hall, I waited for half an hour and then proceeded to make my own preparations. Moving very quietly, I crept up the stairs, and at the top drove one drawing pin into the lintel about a foot up, another at the same height into the baluster opposite, and across the stairs fastened the black thread, with a small bell hanging over the edge. A touch and the bell would ring, whether the thread broke or not. At the foot of the stairs I made another attachment and hung another bell. I think, my unknown friend, I said, as I went back to the chair, you are cut off above and below now. I won't say that I didn't close my eyes for a minute through the whole night, but if I did sleep it was only as a watchdog sleeps. A whisper or a creak of a board would have found me alert. As it was, however, nothing happened. At six o'clock Swarbrick appeared, respectfully solicitous about my vigil. We've done it this time, Swarbrick, I said in modest elation. Not the ghost of a ghost has appeared. The spell is broken. He had crossed the hall and was looking rather strangely at the stairs. With a very queer foreboding I joined him and followed his glance. By heavens, when, there, on the sixth step up, was a bright red patch. I am not squeamish, I cleared four steps at a stride, and stooping down I dipped my finger into the stuff and felt its slippery vicinity against my thumb. There could be no doubt about it, it was the genuine thing. In my baffled amazement I looked in every direction for a possible clue to human agency. Above, more than twenty feet above, were the massive rafters and boarding of the roof itself. By my side reared a solid stone wall, and beneath was simply the room we stood in, for the space below the stairway was not in, closed. I pointed to my arrangement of bells. Nobody has gone up or down, I'll swear, I said a little warmly. Between ourselves, I felt a bit of an ass for my pains, before the monumental Swarbrick.